In lecture six of statistical analysis planning, we're going to cover theory of hypothesis testing. So returning, returning to the indicative scientific method steps, we are now towards the end of our journey. We are going to start looking at the actual hypothesis tests, which will ultimately answer the research question that we pose at the start. Now, before we actually look at the, the various types of tests that are available, we're first of all going to introduce the theory just to make you aware of the concepts that are needed to be understood before you actually apply those tests. Before we start looking at hypothesis testing, I want to remind you of something that I mentioned in the very first lecture, and that is the difference between confirmatory and exploratory data analysis. They are both complementary approaches for statistical research, but with confirmatory data analysis, you have some claim in mind or some hypothesis and you're using the data to confirm that. Whereas with exploratory data analysis, you're coming to the data with no claim in mind, no prior assumptions, and you're just interested in exploring the data and looking for patterns. So as the table shows, hypothesis testing is a big part of confirmatory data analysis. It's not necessarily a big part of the exploratory data analysis because, again, you're not coming to the data with any prior assumptions or claim in mind. And then on the other hand, data exploration is a bigger part of the exploratory data analysis. So both um, good scientific approaches, they're complementary approaches, but because in this particular course, we're looking at hypothesis testing and statistical tests, we're going to focus mainly on the confirmatory data analysis. Now the image on this slide gives you the big picture associated with hypothesis testing and in general statistical inference, which is the process of taking some population made up of people or some other type of unit and you're trying to make some conclusion about that population. Now the issue is you can't get every piece of information from that population. Imagine it's a population of people. You can't go out and measure some quantity associated with each person or ask about their opinion, okay? Because there's too many people, say, in that population. So what you do instead is you take a sample that is representative of your population. And then based on that sample, you make your hypothesis and you test it on that sample. So that conclusions based on that sample can be made and then inferred onto the population. That's where the statistical inference comes. So that's the big picture to keep in mind with all of these hypothesis tests, no matter what the test is. You've got some population, you're interested in the population parameter that is unknown. So what you do instead is you take a sample, calculate the corresponding statistic, and then that's used as evidence when you, make your, uh, when you come to making your conclusion in the hypothesis. So as stated, a big part of statistical research is making claims about populations, claims or hypotheses regarding some characteristic based on sample data. Now these characteristics, if you were to do any undergraduate course, they could be averages or proportions. They are the classic ones that uh, usually start off with in these courses. And we've got some images below of kind of hypotheses that could be tested. Firstly, cats showing their preference for food, is it based on shape or not based on shape? Testing to see if light color has an effect on plant growth. And then another one could be testing to see if age has effect or no effect on music ability. So these are all examples of hypotheses or claims that you could be testing on a population. Now, a hypothesis is simply a claim made about a population parameter whose truth has yet to be proven. You'll recall, hopefully, that a parameter is a value associated with the population and is typically unknown. So this could be population mean, population proportion, and so on. Here are some simple examples of claims. First of all, if we take the image on the right, we could be testing a claim here that how does the amount of fertilizer affect plant growth? So on the right, we have a plant that is subjected to fertilizer, six drops on the left, we have a plant that is not subjected to fertilizer. We monitor growth over time and check if 
the fertilizer does have an effect on growth. Now, other examples of claims include these. Firstly, that mean IQ score of all primary school students in a city is greater than or equal to 100. So that's something a researcher could be checking. Now, you'll notice there one key word there is all. OK, that's all students in this particular city. So the researcher may not be able to access the IQ score of all students. So they'll instead take a sample. Now, the, the hypothesis or claim they're testing is the following, that the mean IQ score is, great, is greater than or equal to 100. So mathematically, that can be posed as follows. And that's essentially your hypothesis. Secondly, we have the claim that the proportion of all customers who prefer product A is equal to 0 0.50. So again, you'll note that you have all in there because it's the entire population of customers. This time we're testing for a proportion, which I'll put the notation here. It's noted P. Okay. Now to write down our hypothesis there, it will be P is equal to 0 0.50. And finally, we have the hypothesis that the main income of all employees or the mean income of all employees in company X is equal to the mean income of employees in company Y. So you've got two companies, X and Y, and you're interested in the income of all employees in X and all employees in Y. Now, notationally, that can be written as follows. So the symbol for the mean, the population mean, is denoted with the Greek symbol mu. I haven't mentioned that too much here. I don't want to get you confused with all this notation, but this is the symbol that you will see for the population mean if you do any further analysis or further research. So we could denote that mu x and the population mean for company applies for company y is mu y. And we're testing to see if they're equal. So we just put in an equal symbol there. Now, one thing to note here in all of these hypothesis is that there is some form of an equals symbol in there. Okay, you've got the standard equality symbol there. And here you've got greater than or equal to so the equals does come in there. So what this means is, when you're making your hypothesis, you always start off assuming nothing has changed or that you've got the equality in there. Okay, I'll talk more about this on the next slide. But the hypothesis we've actually defined here are the first part of your hypothesis definition, you've got what's called a null hypothesis. We're also going to have the alternative to these, the uh, alternative hypothesis. So for example, down here, you would also have the alternative hypothesis, which is always the opposite of that statement. So in this case, it would be not equals to 0 0.50. Let's discuss that on the next few slides. So as I alluded to on the previous slide, a hypothesis test actually consists of two hypotheses. Firstly, there's the null hypothesis, which is a statement about the value of a population parameter, whether that parameter is the mean, proportion, or difference of two means, and so on. Now, the aim of the hypothesis test is to test HO, where the result will either be to reject it or fail to reject it. Now, that seems like an awkward phrasing there, fail to reject HO. It would be easier to think of that as accept HO. But the reason we always use the phrasing fail to reject HO is we need to remember that a hypothesis test is a statistical test. It's never going to definitively prove if HO is true or false. Rather, it simply indicates that there's not enough evidence in the sample data to conclude that HO is false. So keep that in mind, it's a statistical test. As I also mentioned in the previous slide, your null hypothesis must always contain a condition of equality. So you have three options there, equals, less than or equals, or greater than or equals. The reason for this, again, is because we start off assuming nothing has changed, it's just equal to something. Now, going back to the examples that we mentioned in the previous slide, if we take the mean IQ score of all primary school students example, we start off assuming that it's greater than or equal to 100. Okay, so because it's got the equal in the greater than or equal to, that goes into the null hypothesis. 
And if you were to write that down, it would look something like this. So HO, and because it's a population mean, a mean IQ score, I'll use a symbol mu, and it's simply greater than or equal to 100. The second one has a proportion for all customers. So our null hypothesis there will be HO, and it's a population proportion, and it's equal to 0 0.50. So they're the, the null hypotheses. Now the second part of that will be the alternative hypotheses. So in the next slide, we'll look at the, the alternative for, for these two examples. So once you have that null hypothesis written down, it should be easy enough to write down the corresponding alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is denoted HA, and it's just the opposite of the null hypothesis. Now, because the null hypothesis will always contain a condition of equality, it's the opposite for the HA. It will contain a condition of non-equality. So not equals to less than, greater than. So if we look at the examples below, these are the corresponding alternative hypotheses for the examples we had on the previous slide. So if, just to remind you, we had HO, where the mean IQ score is greater than or equal to 100. The alternative hypothesis then is just the opposite of that, which is written here, but notationally, it can be written as follows. Mu is less than 100. Returning to the proportion example, the null hypothesis for that was that the proportion of all customers who prefer product A is equal to 0 0.50. The alternative then is the opposite of that, which notationally can be written as the proportion is not equal to 0 0.50. So in this case, then the alternative is, we don't care if it's less than 0 0.50 or greater than 0 0.50, just as long as it's, it's different. And we could also do the example for on the right with the checking to see if light color has the, if an effect on plant growth. In this case here, we have the alternative. And let's say we're, the parameter of interest is, say, the average height of the plant. Okay, so we could write that as the, pop, the height of the plant is not equal to some value, which we could put in. The, the null hypothesis then would be the opposite of that, and it would be mu, the population height, is equal to some value, or it could be we could also use. Maybe it makes more sense there to say greater than or equal to some average height. Then for the alternative, it would be less than. So there's lots and lots of different types of hypothesis tests, but ultimately you're always trying to assess some claim about a population property or parameter. So on this slide, we're just gonna go through some very common examples. In the subsequent lecture, then we'll go through lots more. So some very typical ones you see, and these are ones even in undergraduate courses, students will do by hand, but some of the more advanced ones towards the end, these could definitely be do, done on a computer. So the first one that students typically encounter is a one sample t-test. And this is where you have one population and then one sample, and you're making a claim about that population mean. Second one, a one proportion t-test. That again is where you've got a population and a sample from that population, and you're making a claim or comparing a proportion from that population. Next, we have independent sample t-test. That's where you have two populations, two independent populations or groups, and you're comparing the mean from both groups, testing to see if they're different, one is greater than the other or the other way around. With that, the, the populations and sample sizes don't necessarily have to be the same. Now, I mentioned that because a paired sample t-test is where you have, you're comparing two groups to similar groups, so they have to have the same um, size. So for example, a classic example is, let's say you're comparing uh, shoes, left shoe with a right shoe. Say you're checking the, to see if the average length 
is the same for left shoes as right shoes. And finally, we have what's called a one-way ANOVA test. ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. This is where if you've got several groups, okay, several independent groups, three or more, and you're determining if the means of those three or more groups are the same or not. And to be specific, this test will also have a null alternative hypothesis, like all the ones above. The null hypothesis for a one-way ANOVA test is all group means are equal. So let's say mean one is equal to mean two, equal to mean three for the, those three populations or groups. The alternative then is at least one group mean is different. So not that they're all different, but just at least one is different. Now, and I mentioned this first point on a previous slide. We need to keep in mind that hypothesis tests are statistical methods, okay? The result we get from a hypothesis test is not definitive. It's always a statement of probability, okay? So these hypothesis tests, they will never prove or disprove if the result is certain, but we can attach a high probability to the conclusion of our hypothesis test. Now with hypothesis tests, there are two types of errors that can occur. Firstly, we have what's called a type one error. This occurs when we reject HO when in fact it is actually true. And related to this type one error, we have what's called alpha or the significance level. So this is the probability of making a type one er error or rejecting HO when it in fact is actually true. It's a similar to when say, say in a court of law, when the accused is found guilty, but they are in fact innocent. Okay, so that's a type one error. Now, on the other hand, we have what's called a type two error. And this occurs when we fail to reject HO when in fact it is actually false. Beta is the probability of observing a type two error. So we also have what's called the statistical power, which is one minus beta. So if beta is the probability of a type two error, i.e. the probability of rejecting HO when it is false, one minus beta is the probability of correctly rejecting HO. So we can summarize those errors in this following table. Firstly, we have a type one error, and that occurs when we reject HO, but in actual fact, it is true. On the other hand, a type two error occurs when we fail to reject HO or we do not reject it, but in actual fact, it is false. Now, a general guideline for the ratio between alpha and beta, where alpha is the significance level and the probability of a type one error, and beta then is the probability of a type two error, is to have that ratio alpha to beta is one is to four. So that means, for example, let's say if alpha is 0 0.05, and we want to have that ratio below, beta then will be 0 0.20. That also means that the statistical power, which we defined as one minus beta, will be 0 0.80. Relating that back above to the table above, so if our significance level is 0 0.05, that means there's a 0 0.05 probability that we reject HO when in fact it is actually true. If beta is 0 0.20, that means there's a 0 0.20 probability we, we fail to reject HO when it's actually false. Now the values of alpha and beta, they are determined by the researcher. Typical values for say alpha are 0 0.05, 0 0.10. And the value of alpha, it's up to the researcher, but it typically depends on the research question or the area of study. For example, let's say you might want a lower alpha that could be used to minimize risk or false positives, which could lead to say harmful consequences. And as, a, as an example, let's say you're in the medical field and you want to test the safety of some new drug. In this case, your null hypothesis HO could be that the, no, the new drug has no effect on a person compared to a placebo. Whereas HA, the alternative could be that the new drug has a beneficial effect compared to the placebo. In this example, you could set, say, alpha at 0 
Now, over the last few slides, I haven't really talked about the actual title, the significance level versus the p-value. So we've discussed the significance level quite a bit now. That is something set by the researcher, and these are very typical values for the significance level. Now, we need something to compare with that, which will ultimate, and that comparison will ultimately decide whether we reject H O or fail to reject H O. So that comes from what's called the p-value. And that's a value that comes from the sample data and just measures how compatible our data is with HO. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of how it's calculated. In most cases, on a, you'll be doing this on a computer. You have your predetermined alpha and you will be reading off a p-value. So the computer will be doing all the work in the background. But just to give a broad overview of what's happening, you have this situation down here. Let's say you've got a normally distributed set of data. Alpha is the value that you set, and it turns out to be, in this case, the area to the right of the vertical line, where that vertical line separates the fail to reject HO and the reject HO region. Your p-value then is this area out here in this shaded region. So it's an area under the curve that can be out to the right of that vertical line or to the left of it. And it's the relationship between those two values, the significance level area and the p-value that determines if you reject or fail to reject HO. Now, in the first case, let me clear all that. So, as shown in the graph here, if your p-value happens to be less than the significance level alpha, you're out here in the reject HO region. So the big thing to remember here, and this is critical for all the hypothesis tests we're gonna be doing later on, or dis discussing where we don't go to, into the ins and outs of how they're done, what you're looking for is the comparison between the p-value and the significance level. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you're on this region here, you're going to reject HO. You have what's called a statistically significant result. Whereas on the other hand, let's say your p-value happened to be in here. You would have this shaded region all to the right of that vertical line. Because now the p-value is greater than alpha, you're in here you're in the fail to reject HO. So you have what's called a not statistically significant result. So that's the big picture. Ultimately with these tests, you're comparing the significance level, which you choose with a p-value and the p-value comes from the sample. So that's gonna change depending on the diff whatever sample you end up using. Now let's say we have observed a statistically significant relationship or different. It doesn't tell us the magnitude of that relationship or difference. We know it's significant, but we don't know how big that difference or relationship is. And that's where we can use what's called the effect size. The effect size is used to measure the magnitude of the relationship or difference from our hypothesis test. Now, depending on the hypothesis test, you're going to have different effect size. Again, these are quantities I'm not going to calculate in this course. And in a lot of places, it'll be on a computer as well. You'll have done a hypothesis test and as part of SETI output, you might get one of these effect size. So just to go through a few quick examples, firstly, we have what's called Cohen's D. This effect size is associated with the difference between two group means, okay? And we have these three categories to help us determine the magnitude of the uh, difference between the two groups. So if our Cohen's D is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5, we have a small effect or a small difference between 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, it's medium, and then greater than 0.8, it's large. Then if we're interested in the relationship between two numerical variables, and we actually encountered this one earlier in the course with scatter plots, that's the correlation coefficient. And again, you have your three categories depending on the value for the, um, correlation. Note, in this one here, I've only written down if it's a positive correlation. It's a similar idea if you're dealing with a negative correlation. So next we have Cohen's F, which is associated with an ANOVA test, analysis of variance. You recall that's if we're looking at the difference between the mean, means of three or more independent groups. And similarly, you have your three categories associated there to determine the effect size and finally, then, if we have two categorical variables, we can quantify the association by looking at this quantity phi. 
And again, we have our three categories. So this has been the longest recording of this uh, course, but I think this is the most, the one, the heaviest in terms of theory. In the next section, what we'll do is we'll start looking at how you pick the hypothesis test that's most appropriate for your research study. And we won't go into the ins and outs of how those hypothesis tests work, but a lot of what those hypothesis tests involve is based on the theory covered in this recording.